Thanks, Tony. Um, so, as has been mentioned today, uh, we kind of this is the ring of, of confidence um, alongside here of the the green and blue nodes. And what we've done is some analysis to look at what the wider socioeconomic impacts um, of complete care are. Um, so we've taken four themes um, as a starting point. So looking at crime, health and wellbeing, education and the local pound. And we've used some of our data um, to look at for every Mary on, on the pilot or living within Birmingham, actually what is the interaction uh, between each of those nodes and, and what are the kind of... Um, nodes which have a, a higher pull to each individual so noting that even though the the pilot program is for over 65s actually uh, one size doesn't fit all for even that cohort of people um, and the data that we hold as Experian can help us segment that population further to understand the needs the behaviors the lifestyles the characteristics of those individual people in order to create a personalized service that um, that meets the needs of those those people um, so this is just one example, um, like one of the, the segments that we've created. So here we've got a kind of a picture of um, a Mary, um, and this group here represents about 30% of people on, on the current pilot. Um, so from looking at segmenting those people, and um, we can then build up a picture of uh, their kind of everyday life and the assets that they're likely to interact with. For example, um, this group here um, has low levels of um, further education, low levels of physical activity. Um, they are likely to live alone, probably very isolated individuals, uh, worried about being a victim of crime, are likely to be um, feel faith is important. So do they go to their local church or a religious organisation? Um, so what are they already involved in? Um, but also uh, recognising some of the, the new things that they might want to be involved in. So actually, what is the um, overall uptake of technology within these groups of people so far? Maybe for this group, it will be lower than a different over 65 group. For example, my parents who they've got a smartphone now, they're already using technology. So those over 65s will be very different to the experience of this group here. So we've extended that further by looking at some uh, behavioural correlations. And um, so this example here, this graph, just shows some of the, the groups that we have um, in terms of our segmentation, um, but also looks at um, the, the correlations between some of the things that have been mentioned today. So Andrew mentioned CPD is a big issue in terms of cost. Um, and when we correlate that with the levels of financial stress that those groups also have, it's a sort of near perfect correlation. Um, so it kind of points to um, what Sam was saying around new models of delivering things. So actually, if, if these people um, are likely to have COPD, but also have a lot of worries around stress, is that exacerbating their condition? Can you link up services around debt advice with those services around COPD in order to improve the patient experience but reduce COPD admissions? Um, so a good example of this is, for example, um, the British Lung Foundation um, have moved their testing services, their community testing services to bingo halls because they recognise that those groups in the top right hand corner um, enjoy going to bingo. So they've increased the amount of people from the target groups that they, they now test for COPD by going to the community assets they likely to reside in and use um, in their day to day life. Uh, so this is just another example of the same thing, really, but just geographically. So in Shard End, you can see here that it's the same high-risk areas that um, are likely to smoke, likely to have financial difficulty, and likely to prefer bingo. So just highlighting some of those correlations in order to think about new models of, of delivery. Um, so another example that I just wanted to share today um, was some of the proximity analysis that we've done. So this is looking at um, the, the pilot um, postcodes mapped across Birmingham. Um, so you can see here that there's correlations in um, Borsal Heath, Shard End and Castle Vale has already been mentioned. But when you look at, um, as Tony said earlier, around, you know, lots of people actually want to volunteer that are on the pilot. So how do you enable that and how sustainable is that? So we did some analysis to look at how close, um, if you're a patient on complete care, how close is your nearest other patient on complete care? Um, and actually, it's a two-minute two minute walk away. So that's quite a sustainable way of actually enabling that volunteering that, that people want to do. 
Um, and the other one is around accessibility to green space. So actually, uh, we looked at the, the pipeline and they're twice as far away from green spaces than an average Birmingham resident. Um, so that, that kind of poses a question to potentially the navigators and other um, befriending services and other nodes on the complete care. How do you enable people to get to spaces and use those mo most effectively to, in order to improve their well-being? Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of some of the, the work that we've done. Um, and I'll hand back over to Clive. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you very much, uh, those three good people. Um, we are four minutes, you'll be pleased to know. Um, and what I want to do um, to introduce now into coffee is to say, so what's the digitalization all about? And now we're starting to move from the, f the conceptual frameworks and the frameworks of procurement and finance into this. All right. Okay, well, we can just run it and, uh, and, and then we can see and maximize it. That's it. So this will hopefully give you um, uh, an idea now as to how we are beginning to think about how digitalization is fitting into this. Hamid. Before you start this, can, can I just ask everyone to, to look at this video? This is obviously a result of um, a lot of the stakeholders very <coughs> strongly together come up with this one scenario. And, and we are in no way saying this is definitive. So what we're expecting you to do after the practical is basically to plan and have a think about what you think is missing from that. And what's possible, what's not possible. So just uh, watch that and then grab the coffee and come back to do it. All right, thank you. p.m. to 7 a.m. Mary is in bed and she is being monitored for quality of sleep and vital signs. If she wakes the room lighting will come on and if she does not return to bed within 10 minutes a message will be spoken wherever she is asking her if she's all right. Her digital assistant will then decide what type of help she may need. It's 7 a.m. Mary rises and goes to the kitchen. The kitchen already knows how Mary uses the equipment and readies itself to keep her safe. Now it's time for her to get dressed and she wears clothing which will monitor her health and patterns. Of it's 7.15 and Mary is taking antibiotics. On her way from the kitchen she feels a little dizzy. This is detected and again she is asked if she is okay. It's 7.30 a.m. and Mary visits the bathroom. She takes an automatic shower and her weight is monitored and if necessary dietary suggestions are made. It's 8 a.m. and depending what's in the fridge Mary will be advised what food she needs to get. It's 9am and Mary is prompted to take her medicines which are automatically dispensed. She is also reminded of her day's appointments. The system keeps track of her medicines and automatically generates requests for replacement. It's 9.30am and Mary usually goes on the bus. But today she is not sure. So her digital assistant, using a personalised interface, will help her make choices from a range of options that are available to her today. It will then help her with her wardrobe choices and arrange transport for her. It's 9.45 and Mary sometimes goes to the supermarket on the bus. She sits next to Janet and their smart devices detect their and the length of time. The GPS system helps Mary to get off at the right stop and the supermarket will register her presence. It's 12 noon and Mary normally visits the butcher before midday, but his smart system has not registered her today, so it automatically asks for information. All seems to be well as she's been doing other things, and so the butcher's smart system updates Mary's profile with the variants. 
It's 12.15 and Mary's digital assistant tells her that it's her nephew's birthday. By touching his picture, she is connected immediately. It's 5 o'clock and the temperature in Mary's house is dropping. The fire is switched on automatically. But Mary does not want this because of the cost and so she switches it off. The system continues to monitor and asks Mary if she is sure and may need to decide what type of help to summon. It's 8pm and Mary decides to cook something. Her digital assistant, with knowledge of what food is available, Mary's skills in the kitchen, her dietary requirements and her metabolism suggests a suitable recipe. It's 10 p.m. and Mary retires to bed. The light goes off automatically and monitoring begins. So I'm quite sure that as you're watching that, you'll be thinking, oh, what about, what about, and that's, that's daft, that, that's not going to work. Exactly what we want you to think, so please get some coffee and have some chat.